Machine learning and AI have changed the face of the industry in recent years. Most business and IT-related researchers employ the use of multiple machine learning techniques in order to ensure specific analysis of gathered data. It has become such an essential part of the industry today that many cloud service providers have also provisioned ML capabilities as a part of their managed services. Amazon SageMaker is one such managed service provisioned by AWS which allows developers to build, train and deploy machine learning model in a production-ready environment. So if you feel the need to dig deeper and know more about it, stay right where you are as we are going to bring you all the information that you need right on your screens. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, I want to request you to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new update or video releases from Great Learning. If you enjoy this video, show us some love and like this video. Knowledge increases by sharing, so make sure you share this video with your friends and colleagues. Make sure to comment on the video for any query or suggestions and I will respond to your comments. Now very quickly, let me walk you through the agenda for today's course. In today's course, we are going through the introduction to Amazon SageMaker, then Amazon SageMaker's architectural review, and then we will look at hands-on on Amazon SageMaker. Now we start with what exactly is SageMaker, right? So visualize an environment where you have, you as a data scientist was writing your code in Python or you, you've been using any of those libra existing library in TensorFlow, and then you have been doing your training, testing, and validation in your own um, infrastructure in terms in your laptop or on your on-prem environment. Now you have around terabytes of data or petabytes of data that is needs to be churned, right? So how exactly are you going to do it? In your existing environment, it's going to take you maybe weeks time before you're going to get your complete data trained and when you get back your result. Now, how can you sort out that issue? And that's where we're going to see um, Amazon SageMaker. Now, what exactly is this product? You're going to launch SageMaker. Immediately, it's going to come and give it to you a Jupyter-based notebook. It's going to say, okay, I'm going to provide you with a Jupyter-based notebook. You can start writing your code over there. Many of the existing framework, which is, which is um, available, um, popular frameworks that is available in the market, Almost close to 15 to 20 frameworks are available. And so you can just pick it up from an existing sample notebook, which is available inside Amazon examples. And you can start tailoring that particular notebook and create your training models from there itself. You're going to see all those things. So that's the first options available for you. Uh, and pay per second, right? So you don't need to pay. Um, um, the moment you invoke that SageMaker, you will be charged based on seconds. So you don't need to be, in case you're not going to use it, immediately your billing cycle stops over there. And it supports all MXNet, Gluon, TensorFlow, and all those models are, all the frameworks are available for you uh, in it. All right. Now moving on. So this is what we have discussed right now, the, the typical machine learning process problem, right? So in your current and on-prem environment, what exactly the process looks like? Your machine learning frameworks looks like first data collection. You're going to collect your data. There should be some source for doing that. You need to do your data integration. You have to do your preparation. Once you're done with your data preparation, you have to find figure out your inference statistics, right? So you want to do uh, kind of like how exactly your data looks like. Is this, is this the proper data where you want to run your algorithm? What sort of an algorithm that you want to run it? So so first you want to do uh, visualization of your data, how exactly you're going to, your data is going to look like. So um, after that, you're going to do your feature engineering, model training, and all these are going to be your process, which you will be going through in your environment, right? In case you're not going to use as a platform as a service, you will be relying on n number of AWS services for doing this task. Instead, what you want to do is you want to rely on a platform as service, which is going to be Amazon SageMaker, right? So the moment you launch SageMaker, first and foremost, you're going to get a Jupyter notebook. It's going to be a reliable GPU powered productivity ready workspace of a data scientist and developer. So that's exactly your Jupyter notebook. Next one is going to be a SageMaker algorithm. As I said, 
there are n number of built-in algorithms available for you. Next, you are going to do your training service. Now, what you need to understand over here is the machine that you have taken for launching this notebook is not the guy who's going to come for training for you. I just want to make this point repeated again. So the point number one is nothing but a small instance is going to come in your environment. Please try to visualize it exactly the way it is so that it's easier for you to digest the concept. Point number one is one small machine, which is maybe an M4 X large machine came for you, where you're going to write your code, where you're going to write your Python code, or, or you're going to do your uh, the kind of data engineering. That's exactly what you're going to do over here. That's going to be a smaller machine, right? A CPU-based machine, right? Then you're going to select your algorithm. And the next, when you want to run your training service, what you need to understand is immediately a bigger machine is going to, a GPU-based machine is going to come for you just for running your training process, right? A bigger machine, massive bigger machine is going to pick up your data from somewhere. That somewhere is going to be our S3 bucket. It's going to pick it up from S3 bucket, do this process, uh, your training process. The moment it gets completed, it's going to automatically get dies by itself and your endpoint is going to get deployed um, um, in, the, in the SageMaker as well, right? So that's how exactly it's going to run. So this machine is going to be different and this training machine is going to be different. So that's how exactly we're going to see this, um, how exactly this particular SageMaker is going to work for you. Any question over here before we deep dive uh, into this component? So this is the component that we're going to deep dive into and understand how exactly it's going to work. Okay, so no worries. I mean, all this while, if you're not able to completely come in sync with me, remaining slides are going to be something which we are going to slowly and steadily go one by one and understand component by component. And that's exactly what you're going to do in a hands-on demo as well. So I expect a lot more interaction during that time. Fair enough. So this is the fair level hawk's eye view of what exactly SageMaker as a product has given you. Okay. So this is the complete architectural overview. And till now, I have not asked you to be completely attentive over here, but now I want you guys complete attention over here. This is where we're going to actually start our session, right? So all this while it was a lot of stories, but this is the meat of this program. Fair enough. Okay, you can see multiple pros over here. Start your training program, blah, 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 training algorithm, each and every of this step, right? We are going to see what does this stuff means. First and foremost, that you need to understand from this is, as I said, in Amazon SageMaker, there are built-in algorithms available for you. That means your XGBoost, your PCA, your uh, K-means algorithm, all these algorithms are available as a Docker container for you, right? And that is residing inside uh, Elastic Container Re Registry or ECR. Are we all good with that? There is an ECR container registry where I have my algorithm kept inside a Docker container. That's exactly what uh, how I want you guys to visualize. Are we all in sync, right? Now let's see how exactly this process works. Now the moment I kick start my or um, I start my SageMaker or my training process, what I want to do is um, the moment I kick start my SageMaker, what I want to do is I want to bring in my Container. So think of this as my HXG boost algorithm that is available inside a Docker container, right? I'm going to bring that into my SageMaker session. That's the first step, right? Once I'm done with it, I'm going to bring. Uh, so so you can see over here. Start with my training algorithm packed with into Docker image, publish into Amazon EMR. Now SageMaker algorithm is available inside your session and. Visualize this, this gray box as your session, right? So SageMaker pulled the algorithm inside the session. Now, what, what more is required by this guy? He needs actual data, which you need to supply. And you will be pushing that data inside an S3 bucket. The next task for you would be pull that data from S3 bucket inside the SageMaker session. I'll be all in sync till here. I may just need a confirmation now at least. Forget about all this previous slides, what we covered, but this is the time where I want you guys to be in sync with me. 
are we all good till here whatever the process has been done great uh thank you folks right so now once our process is completed so my container is sitting inside my sage maker session my data is also inside my sage maker session now how big you want this container that's up to you right you can say i want my container to be as big as a p4 um, uh, i think it's a p3 um, 8x large machine or it needs to be a bigger bigger machine where do you need to specify that it's inside your code and where i'm going to show you that part right or you can even mention that i wanted to bring in a parallelism inside what i'm doing i want not just one docker container coming up i want around five docker container parallelly coming up all those things you're going to supply as a parameter right so the moment i do that in parallel all those things are going to come up for you fair enough and i have my data also data there are multiple ways of bringing in data which we're going to see i can either pull my entire data at one shot or i can i can have a different format altogether where my data can be streamed less less data can be pushed into each container and things like that fair enough okay now moving on so now think of now the training process started because the docker container came over here it started the training process so once the training process is completed it's going to come up with something known as uh, a model artifact which will be stored inside an s3 bucket and an inference code image also will be created inside uh, a, a registry and an ecr reg or elastic container registry right so uh, there will be a model artifact as well as your image right so inference image also will be available over here for you right now when you deploy your model because you created a model now you need to deploy that model somewhere right so when you deploy it that's my next process when i deploy it that's where you're going to get your inference code also your model artifact will be called up from your s3 bucket and i'm going to package it and create an endpoint right so that's exactly what you can see over here i create an endpoint now what's happening is when you create this endpoint you may have a massive bigger machines running over here and this also you can specify how exactly you want your endpoint to be catered whether do you want one single smaller machine so the model that we have built now we have created an endpoint and understand folks this is the endpoint which you will be calling from an external application pull it up and i can use it in my in my program All right so that's that's what exactly this endpoint is right and the final thing that's nothing that i want to discuss right now that's that's nothing but the ground truth ground truth is um, a service an additional service available in sage maker where you can utilize a labeling functionality um inside amazon uh, ground truth we'll talk about that slightly later right so that's going to be my end to end flow of creating a model or building a model by sage maker in our environment any questions over here before we actually go through now complete hands on and all this informations are picked up from amazon uh, documentation you have every single things available how step by step what process is is working on good so far great okay so we are going to see all these things live in action now right so make sure you are having registered yourself this process picking up a docker container bring up into a session take your data bring up into your sage maker session doing your uh, the moment you build your training the training artifacts is going to get stored inside s3 bucket also your interface uh, inference code image also is being created and when you run your inference both this will be combined together and i'm going to create an endpoint and from an external application you will be calling up this endpoint to get your predicted models right so i'm going to call this and it's going to give you a predictions back that's how exactly the entire life cycle runs fair enough okay so that's how it works and just going to stop uh, push this because we may not have enough time to cover the ground truth we may be all right so that being said we are going to directly jump into our sage maker sessions and things like that i just created some backup environment as well in case um you guys know how exactly a demo session would be right it may not work exactly the time when you really need it so i just created some backups uh, environment somewhere so that we are all good um first and foremost what i want to show you guys is um is there an area or a region where i can start 
everything together. Okay, let's start with, okay, SageMaker services. Where do I get it? I'm assuming everyone know how to get into our, this AWS um, um, console, provide your user ID, password, and get into AWS console. You guys are an expert in that, I'm pretty mature. I've selected my North California region, right? The reason behind, nothing specific. I just want to have my demo started over here, but I'm going to switch back to an environment where I have already created and kept it something so that we don't waste time doing that. Okay, I'm in my North California now and the uh, Amazon SageMaker, I'm going to type in Amazon. Um, sorry, I missed it. It's better, just, just put in SageMaker, right? Click on SageMaker, which is there on my left-hand side of my screen, All right? It's going to say Amazon SageMaker build, train, and deploy machine learning models at scale, right? So that's exactly what you can see. There is a build process, there's a train process, there's a tuning, uh, hyperparameterized parameter tuning. That's also we're going to discuss. And then I can deploy my model, right? Make sure you're visualizing that image which we have spoken about um, some time back. All right, so where do I start my journey with? Click on notebook instance. Now, what exactly is this? This is the place where you're going to create your Jupyter notebook, right? So how do I do that? Click on create notebook instance. I'm going to say my notebook instance name, um, great learning notebook. Uh, I just want to have North Cal um, California, NC over here, right? Notebook is coming back and asking you, okay, how big a machine you need, right? Does your re <clears throat> data crunching or do you have a humongous amount of data with you do your data engineering process is going to take you uh, does that make you go for a massive bigger machine or are, are, you, are you okay with a smaller machine that's a question it's going to ask you so that's where you can see over here understand one thing folks this is not a machine that is responsible for training right uh, let me just come back to that slide once again so this part not this part. For training, there is a different machine altogether going to come up. So first, to write your code, what is the machine that you require? Now, you may have your question, so why do I need to have a massive big machine just for writing my code? Understand, even your data engineering, your data, uh, the feature engineering, whatever manipulation, whatever the data massaging, data crunching, all those things, what you want to do, that should be done in this machine. That's the reason you have to choose an appropriate machine which can actually do that task for you. I'm going to pick up T2 Medium. Uh, I would request you guys to just go for aws.amazon.com slash free, which says for two months, there is one machine available for you. I am assuming that's going to be T2 Medium. We don't have a T2 micro machines over here, right? Um, I would assume it should be T2 Medium so that you also can exactly do this exercise by yourself without, I mean, free of cost. That's exactly what I mean, right? Um, now, the permission part of it, so you may have to create an Amazon SageMaker role. In case if you don't have one, you're just going to say create a new role option and you're going to select which S3 bucket you're interested in, or you can create all S3 bucket. I, I do already have a role in place, so I don't need to worry about it. And my assumption is you guys are pretty much aware of what exactly is the role and things like that. Now, if you have an S3 bucket where your data is residing, you can even specify only that bucket name over here or I'm going to say any S3 bucket. That means every single S3 bucket you have access to. Right? I don't want to do that right now because I do have uh, a role already available. Okay, um, I'm going to stick on to complete default mode over here. And what I'm going to do is create notebook instance. Click on this. That means a T2 medium machine is going to come up for me. Okay, and this process is going to take some time for you. Um, it's going to take some time before that's our first process that's got completed. Uh, Building up. One uh, question. Uh, sure, go ahead. So we selected uh, T2 medium here, right? So what is the parameter? Uh, on what basis I can decide uh, whether to select medium or large or extra large or something like that? Yeah, so that visibility you should be having. Basically, in case if, you're, if your data is going to be pretty heavy in, heavy or huge, and then you're going to see my data crunching. For doing my data crunching, I may need a bigger machine, right? So, so you know that there are T2 medium, T2, 8x large, 4x large sort of machines. 
So I need to understand for churning my data, one GB RAM and one core processor, that's not enough, right? So that kind of an insight you should be having yourself because otherwise what's going to happen, it's going to take you a massive, huge amount of time doing it. And even at times what happens if your entire data needs to reside in memory, even it can fail also. So that decision you should be knowing based on your cloud expertise. Um, so that's that's where you need to. So just go and see the configuration for T2 medium and see how much is it. It's going to be two core, uh, four core processor and two GB. But now when you're going to have around 500 GB of data to be played around in this environment, it's going to say, I'm not happy with you, right? So that's exactly where you are going to make a decision. No, I cannot survive in T2 medium machine with 500 GB of data. I may want to go for a bigger machine so that I can get my data engineering process or uh, engineering um, process being processed much faster. Otherwise, it's going to take you almost four or five hours for your data crunching process. Okay. But this is only during development time, right? Absolutely. Yes. This is your development time. Great. Any questions or can we move forward? Uh, yeah. I have one question. Uh, Go ahead. Like, uh, this instance, right, uh, it says ml.t2. So normally we don't see this ml is this uh, specific to machine learning. It's That's like, correct. That's correct. You will be allowed to pick up only those machine learning. So this is customized for machine learning. So behind architecture is made in such a way that your machine learning uh, kind of an engineering process, uh, these machines are customized for that. So we would not recommend you to pick up a T2 medium or, or uh, 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 like, uh, what is that, C4 or C5 machines to run this. You pick okay. up machines only which start with ML dot, blah, blah, blah. That's okay. that's a kind of machine. Uh, I see there is an option for uh, get repository. Uh, what is that uh, for? And is there any option for auto-scaling? Yes, you had, um, okay, let me just real quick show you that part. So you can get your code, bring up from Git repository as well. So if you have a Git connected, Right, so you can get your code dot from your, you can mention your repository over here and you can get your, um, I mean, the kind of CICD pipeline established over here. The moment you do, um, you upload your code over there, you want to get it, you, your credential needs to be supplied over here and that data can be pushed in. It can be pulled from your Git. So that's exactly, I mean, I have not done much of that activities, but yeah, so once just for a POC purpose, I've, I've done that, that part. So that's what the Git is. And okay, one thing which you mentioned, I guess I I missed that part. Where did you see inference part? Um, elastic inference, or or you, your own experience you're talking about, or you did not see it over here, right? No, uh, I didn't see it uh, over here. Maybe an additional configuration. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not an additional configuration. So the elastic inference is not available in North California right now. That that's the reason for it. Okay, so I'm just going to show you that. I'm just going to come out of this. Um, I'm just going to cancel this. Okay. So Elastic Inference is available maybe, yeah, so our Ju Jupyter Notebook is anyways ready, but we're not going to run over here. We're going to run this process inside Ohio, where, let me just real quick show you Elastic Inference as well. Uh, create a notebook. I guess it should be available over here. Right, you can see over here elastic inference. Yeah, so that feature is not. So I'm assuming you guys know that uh, the moment AWS uh, deploy a feature, they are not going to do it a GA, right? That means global availability. So they don't they don't do it to the entire. Uh, uh, I guess now AWS have around 21 or 22 regions. They are not going to deploy this new feature to the entire 23 region. Instead, they're going to do first a pilot or the beta version in. Uh, North Virginia and maybe a couple of more other region, right? After that, once they are completely um, confident about uh, the services features, a, a customer traction and all those bug fixing and everything has been done or, or more features customers are asking, once they introduce more and feature and functionality to it, then they are going to push that to the remaining part of the region. So that's, that's the kind of approach um, AWS does. So you would not have seen that feature in North California, but you can see that feature over here. Now, Elastic Inferences, this guy, um, I'm going to go back to my slide now. Uh, you can see over here the last thing which we spoke about. Yeah. The endpoint, remember this guy? Yeah. This endpoint, when I deploy this endpoint, think of now, where do you call this from? Maybe you have uh, greatlearnings.com. 
web page and when you click on one single button that's the time that api will be called and along with that button you would have already supplied the parameter as well i mean the you are you are you are training data or sorry not the training your actual data right and immediately it's going to hit this endpoint and it's going to do that model will be run on top of it and it's going to immediately give you back the result i'm i'm not sure whether you guys are all able to sync it up right so think of now greatlearning.com the website and from there you have supplied data to the a small text box is available over there where you supplied your data and the moment i click on a button immediately that needs to call up this endpoint do that uh, modeling uh, come back with the prediction result and that result should be displayed at the next line on the great learning uh, website page right now think of you're going to create a massive big csv file it has around uh, 1 million records available inside that that's the kind of data you're supplying the moment you go and hit this endpoint what's going to happen it's going to take a huge amount of time before it can process and send back the result to you right that's when your elastic inference is going to come in handy for you what it's going to tell you is in case if your data is going to be massive big based on that multiple similar kind of an instance will keep coming up and is going to process it all for you and is going to send back result the moment you are done with it it's going to die by itself right that's the elasticity we are talking about over here so we are going to go back and cancel this and we have our notebook available over here right so now our notebook is ready you can see over here the sage maker open jupiter notebook yeah that's it um, i thought it it was there over somewhere over here i think they changed some features again all right so what you did is you have created a jupiter notebook now right so the moment you create a jupiter notebook and you have some machine learning data to be crunched and and things like that it took you almost 5 hours but you don't need to keep this t2 medium machines running throughout right it is going to incur some cost for you instead what i want to do is i'm just going to immediately take this and stop it over here no charge incurred right so that's how exactly you should be doing it in case if you don't want to just terminate it in case we want to do some experiment even tomorrow you may just end or you may just stop this machine and no charges incurred for the compute purpose otherwise your clock is ticking now fair enough now what i'm going to do is i'm going to just open a jupyter notebook bike sharing demand data so i i'll send this repository to you folks yeah this is exactly the data which you have which you are playing around with right so i have the the kaggle so what we are trying to find over here is uh there is um this is the 2011 and 2012 um uh, rental bike data that means uh, on 2000 2011 how much how many number of bike on what hour has been actually taken up from some some location so that's the kind of data it's available over here so think of now in real time scenario uh, if you are someone uh, a ceo of yulu yulu bikes that is available in bangalore now right so using this data you can figure out in 2020 or 2019 december how many number of bike that you require so that i meet my uh, customer needs and i can run much profitable business and what are the things i need to take care in terms of which location should i be placing my bikes and things like that right so what they have done is they given you a data set a live data set of one of the company um and their test uh, or the training data is from um Jan first to Jan nineteenth, Feb first to Feb nineteenth, right? So till nineteenth or twentieth, I believe. Yeah. So let's make it as I think it should be available till twentieth, right? So the first month of till twentieth, data is available as a training data for you every month. So Jan till twentieth, Feb till twentieth, uh, March till twentieth, all those data is available for you. And from twenty first till end of the month, they made it as a test data for you, right? So what you have to do is using your model. you have to do the prediction what would be your actual sales or how many number of bikes will be going for rental during 21st till the end of month so that is something which you need to predict and give it to the kegel i mean if you submitted you have to see your prediction score and things like that a lot more details available for you over here if you try, want to try it on your own as well right so this is how exactly the data looks like and i have downloaded all this data 
this is where, and then this is how the data looks like for you. So you have inside the data, your date time, your season, holiday, working day, whether you have some categorical data, uh, some numerical data, and all those things are available for you, right? This is how exactly it looks like. Um, okay, uh, so now I'll go back. So I have just taken this data, did some customization here and there. It's not working perfectly fine for me, but I'll be sharing this um, IPython notebook with you guys once I get my uh, entire setup. There is something getting goofed up in this environment. Uh, open Jupyter Notebook. <clears throat> so I should not have anything available right now. So just want to show you how exactly you can get your uh, notebook instance or your code being brought in. Right. So first and foremost, I have around uh, three sets of data. Um, so I wanted to bring in my data as well as my, yeah, that's that's going to be my data. So these are the data set which I want to bring into my uh, environment, right? So, so test and train data, which you would have already seen in the Kaggle data set. Um, that's the first, yeah. And so let me just upload that. So it looks like I'm just uploading it. And the remaining files as well. Let me just pick up the remaining files. That's going to be my three files, which I am having open and upload. So once I've done with my complete, um, I may have to do some tweaking to get it uh, working perfectly. Uh, it, it's, it's showing some sort of uh, pay wire result right now. So once I'm sorted out that uh, issue, I will be sharing this uh, Jupyter notebook with you guys so that so that you can you can play around from your end. Okay, so that's my test in the first and foremost, what I want to do is I want to do some data preparation. That's my Sage Maker notebook. One other thing what I want to tell you guys is in case if you're pretty new to this Sage Maker environment and if you want to just kickstart, you have not so familiar with writing any model, creating all those things, Amazon itself has created a SageMaker example one. You can see over here, deep learning AR, um, Amazon algorithm. You can have your LDA, um, K nearest neighbor, and all those available notebooks are available for you. Click on it. You can start putting your data and start your innovation over here. Or, or even there are many of those notebooks, which is even having the notebook, uh, sorry, even having the data inbuilt inside. It's going to uh, retrieve it from one of the S3 bucket and it's going to start doing your processing for you. So it's, it's a much easier environment to start your journey with, right? But what we are trying to do over here is we already have some built-in algorithm available. So we're going to play around with that. Um, so in files, I have all this down, uh, uploaded in, inside my SageMaker now. First and foremost, my data preparation. That's my data re-engineering part. Feature engineering, or I want to do some data massaging over here, right? So let me just do a screen. So I can, so I have already run this process and I'm I'm assuming you guys are familiar with Jupyter Notebook, uh, right? So you can you can use it as a cell. You can, you can have your comments being written over here and all those things, right? Um, that may be slightly beyond the scope over here and you can have it as a markup code or a markup language, blah, 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 right? All those things. And what I want to do is I just want to do a restart and clear output so that we can run it all from the beginning, right? Restart and clear all output. So in SageMaker, you have all your Panda libraries, NumPy, everything, MATLAB, everything installed for it. So you don't need to do a separate installation of any of these libraries. It comes with pre-built libraries of all. So I'm just doing, <clears throat> these are my entries. I'm, I'm importing um, matplotlib so, for my, so that I can just plot and see how exactly my visualization looks like. I'm importing NumPy, Pandas for doing my uh, data processing, right? And I can just do a run over here or in your um, Windows as well as the uh, Mac, it should be Control Enter. The moment I do that, I should have my process running, right? Uh, it's importing NumPy. Yeah, this process completed, right? And I'm going to go back. This is nothing but I just want to fit. This is how exactly your columns look like, right? So if you would have seen that Kegel data set, 
that's how exactly your Kegel data set looks like, right? So that's that's where we have set up the column and kept it exactly the way it is. Uh, not really so relevant over here. Now, what I'm trying to do is I'm reading train.csv as well as test.csv, which is available from your um, um, Kegel data set. That's exactly where we picked it up from. I'm going to load that into my SageMaker. It did not like something. What it did not, what is it giving me? So this, mm, I may have to use one more file where I have done my passing with date and time. So I may have to just use my existing process, which I've run. Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of know what exactly is that. Uh, so I have another library available, which I was doing for my data because I don't have that much time to do that. So what we're going to do is, uh, so I, I'll correct this, this module when I'm going to send it across to you guys. So instead, what I rely now on would be on my data set that's available on, right? and we'll try to see uh, a processed, yeah, I, I did for, want to start from scratch and fresh. Um, yeah, so that's GL SageMaker. That's exactly what I did. Uh, so this is this is the entire thing that you can see over here. And my bike training preparation. This is my data preparation part. And let me just show you how exactly an um, already executed one looks like. Right, so this is where we have executed. Uh, my train and test data got executed. I have just loading my uh, train.csv as well as test.csv into my data set, and I'm naming it as df and df underscore uh, test. Uh, just to see, uh, remember what I said, one, two, let's see whether it's 19 or 20th. No, it's actually 19th, right? So January 1st to January 19th, uh, Feb 1st to Feb 19th. So that's exactly the kind of data you can see. So just to show that I've just listed down over here, right? So till 19th data is what is getting listed over here. Right, which is available inside your uh, train.csv, which will be provided by Kaggle for you. So that's how exactly. So you can see 420, uh, 30th records of 19 and 31st is belong to um, Feb 1st. Right, fair enough. Okay, and I'm just trying to display over here my head records. You can see over here how exactly your data looks like. Now what we want to do is I just want to split this particular date uh, into year, month, day, and week. So that's that's exactly what you're trying to do over here. Right? So add features. And I have extracted this date. And I'm just pushing it into so that I can have my hourly based data available for me. That's the whole and sole reason behind it. Right? So that's what we are trying to achieve over here. So once I'm done with that, uh, so that's, that's the uh, feature I'm adding to it. And you can see over here, df.type. So I have just added, based on this function, I've added year, month, day, and week, hour. So that's exactly what I added at the end of my data set. Right? So it's just cleansing my data. I'm doing my data uh, feature engineering part. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. Now, I'm not sure whether I have executed this part. Uh, no, right? So yeah, so it, it I, I may end up having trouble showing you this part. So, so I'm just doing my correlation. Um, so that's, 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 uh, so what, what I'm seeing over here is I have my maximum correlation with our, so I, I just goofed it up now. Uh, so you should have, you can see in this recording just previous. Um, and then when I'm going to uh, send across this particular file for you, you can try it out, try it out yourself, right? Um, and what we are trying to do is we are trying to take a mean hour, right? So, if, so, so how exactly you need to visualize this? I have this entire data set available with me. This is my data set. So what you're trying to do over here is, um, so what you need to understand is I have just appended my hour, day, time, everything with my existing data. And I'm just plotting it. That's, that's as simple as that. And in the plot, what I'm seeing over here is hourly base. This is how exactly my data looks like. That means zeroth hour, the number of bikes that has gone for running from one location is going to be like close to maybe 60 or something. This is uh, 12 in the midnight and one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock. You can see it's slightly dipping. And then when it 
slightly increases when the day proceeds, right? So eight in the morning, you can see a huge number of guys are using those rental bikes. So 350 bikes are being used eight in the morning. And nine again, it started dipping. And somewhere over, over here at 10, it's again dipped. And you can see over here at the evening time, again, the rental bikes, maximum number of guys are using the rental bikes, right? 450 plus. I, what is the time period? You can see over here at around five o'clock, again, the maximum number of usage happens. So that's exactly what this plot is showing you. Fair enough. So, I mean, it's, it's quite obvious, right? So on a, on, a, on a normal day, when you go to office, many of people might be using, it's, it's a US-based data. Many of those guys are using those rental bike and also they're using those rental bikes during, um, uh, during um, evening when they come back from office. So that's why the peak uh, peak over here, right? So now we are just grouping it based on count of means. That's that's exactly what we did. Now, what we want to do is we want to use this data to be processed by two years. So it's available for 2011 as well as 2012. So that's the data it's available for you over here. So we are just going to take this data and use average hour or index level. And I'm just going to utilize this exact same code which, ha which we have utilized. And this is what I can see as my data, right? I can see my data in 2011, it looks like this blue line. And 2012, it's exactly the similar kind of a trend that has been followed, but only thing is the slightly higher in number, right? So if you are a Yulu guy, and if you want to make a prediction in 2013, it's much easier for you to figure out how many number of bike should I be keeping at one location. And, and if you have an entire different data set which talks about which location am I concentrating on, we using that data, you can say, okay, in the month, uh, in the year of 2013, I should be having somewhere close to close to 600 plus bike kept in, in somewhere in New York or somewhere, somewhere exactly on what city or what location, right? So that's the kind of insight that you can derive from, from this, from this um, plotting, right? Uh, group by hours, I'm just going to and then what we are trying to do over here is we have split this data into working hours. And so you can see in the Kegel data set, you had one was a working day. If it's going to be um, whether the day is later a weekend. Okay. So that's going to be, if it's going to be a one, that's going to be a working day. And if it's going to be zero, that's going to be a non-working day, right? So that's, that's how exactly the data looks like. So in case, and that is exactly the kind we utilized over here. Sorry. It's, yeah. Right. So what I'm doing, I'm doing another plot over here. What it says is if it's going to be one, that means it's a working day. My chart looks exactly the same. Right. Uh, that means eight in the eight in the morning, it's uh, the peak uh, increases and um, five in the evening. Also, my peak is pretty much high. Whereas uh, I can see the data set over here. Uh, it's on on a non-working day or on a holiday, I can see later close to 12 o'clock because people, people might be lazing around. They might be sleeping till uh, till 10 in the morning and close to 12 o'clock, they might be setting up to move somewhere. So on a non-working day, this is the time period when you can see maximum guys are going to use the, use the bike, right? So that's the kind of inference we have made over here. All right df.csv and now what we are trying to do is mm, save all the data so i have kept all the data inside bike underscore all csv that's what we did and now what we're trying to do is we are trying to split that existing data into 70 30 ratio so i'm, I'm assuming everyone is aware of this concept of we are trying to split it 30 percentage of the training data and the remaining three percent um, 30 percent 70 percentage is going to be my training data and the remaining 30 percentage of data I'm going to use for my test purpose, right? So that's the split I'm going to do. And that's exactly what this remaining code is going to do for me, right? So when I do this, you can see over here count given over here, right? So altogether there were 10,886 and my training data is going to be this much. And my test data is going to be like 3000 plus training is going to be 7000 plus. So that's how exactly I split my data and I create it as bike underscore train and I create as bike underscore validation. Um, and split it up to into two. Now the 30 percentage is going to be and bike underscore validation. And this is my data, which is from um, from 20th till end of the end of the what 
uh, month, that data is residing over here of every month. So Jan 20th till 30th, data is available. Feb 20th till 20th, 28th or 29th or whatever, that data is available over here, Feb. So all those data combined together is available for you in the for your testing purpose, right? And I just create that particular data and this is available for me as this, this format. Okay, now moving on, I'm assuming no question over here because you guys would have done this n number of times. You are, now the key part what you want to uh, talk about is would be how exactly I wanted to do a training process. That's the meat of this program, right? Uh, and the prediction one, we may not be having enough time for that part. So what I will be doing is I'll be sharing these files with you guys. We have a small data prediction done with this file itself, let me just check whether I have. Um, and what we'll do is we you can run this on your own uh, with this this particular bike train um, underscore prediction, right? So what you're going to do, do is the existing deployment that we have done, that deployment you will be running through prediction. Right? So that's that's a task which is there for you. Fair enough. Okay, now bike training. How exactly what we did? My I have imported all my modules and blah, blah, blah. Now, what you want to do is you wanted to get create an S3 bucket first. So I have created SPK underscore SageMaker underscore uh, EDU or blah, blah, blah. So let me just go and show you that part. Uh, I'm just going to go to services, right click, open up, and then show my S3 bucket services and S3. Yeah, so the name of this <coughs> SPK <coughs> SageMaker. So SPK SageMaker. That's that's my bucket. Right inside that, I created a bike train folder. Uh, I did not create it. Basically, I just have to uh, keep that. My process over here is going to automatically do that for you. Right. So training file is bike train slash. Um, everything is done for you. So you just need to create this SPK underscore SageMaker.edu or basically whatever the S3 bucket that you want to create, right? And the moment you execute this, you're going to set it up like you will have something like bike train, SPK SageMaker edu slash bike train slash bike underscore train slash bike underscore validation, all this data will be going and residing over here the moment you do this execution, right? So you can see over here, this is how exactly it looks like. Fair enough, nothing, nothing. I mean, this is something which you guys should be familiar with. So not, not gonna go uh, deep over there. And now what you're trying to do over here is this is where you're actually gonna upload your data, right? So you can see over here, write to S3, that's the function that I've written, file name, bucket and key. Right, so we are going to call this function somewhere over here. Right to S3. This is my bike uh, underscore train dot CSV file, which is going to get uploaded inside this particular data set. So that's my bike underscore model, bike underscore train, and bike underscore validation. These three data sets are going to get uploaded when you execute this command. Right, so that three data set is uploaded. And what you can see over here is, you remember we have spoke about uh, our model artifacts will be stored in S3, and that's exactly what you can see over here. S3 model output location. Where exactly you want those, once you process your data, where exactly you want your artifact to get stored over here, that's exactly what you're going to mention over here. right? And you can see where exactly that particular uh, variable is getting used. Now, all these things were something which you would have done n number of times. Don't need to have a lot of clarification or, or something is required over here. Now, over here, the next cell is pretty, pretty important for you. Now, what you're trying to do over here is we are trying to do an X, XG boost algorithm on top of that uh, bike train data set. I'm, my assumption is you guys are pretty familiar what exactly is an XG boost, right? So we are not going to get into that topic. Um, fair enough understanding, or maybe you just need to Google it and figure it out what exactly is XG boost. So just a layman terminology, Multiple trees, okay, uh, just to give you a, a very, very high level hawk's eye view for those of you guys who does not understand a lay layman term. Um, a multiple model combined um, or a multiple tree combined together to form a, a, a pretty, pretty good uh, estimation for me. That's exactly what, how I would 
I would call an XG boost race, right? So, um, so that that's at a high level what you should take it as, right? Or if you're interested, just go search for XG boost. There is a pretty good explanation given over there uh, to understand what exactly is that. Now, the the core understanding that you need to have over here is now where do I get this XG boost algorithm? That's something which you need to know. I'm going to go back to my slide. Remember, we spoke about there is a container available over here, right? I need to bring a container which is filled with XGBOS algorithm written inside. That is what I want to bring into my SageMaker session. Now, how do I do that, right? So where do I get that container? That's the question I should be asking. So I'm going to open up this particular documentation from AWS, Control V and Enter. Right. So this documentation, let me even send that across to you guys straight away. Yeah. So now what it's talking about is in case whatever algorithm that you're going to use, it's going to be blazing text. This is exactly the path you need to find out. Colon tag is nothing but if you're going to use a previous version or the latest version. So by default, if you don't use a tag, it's going to be treating it as a latest version. You can see over here, the instance class can be a GPU based instance or a CPU based instance for my uh, blazing text. Uh, so I'm going to search for my existing algorithm, which I'm going to use. You can see over here completely. I'm going to search for XG boost. So basically what I need to use is I need to use ECR underscore path slash XG boost inside my, uh, my algorithm, which is, which looks like this. So where did I get this one? So, so this is exactly what I should be using now. Where would I get this information? I'm oh, sorry. Where would I get this information? ECR path. Just scroll down. You can see over here. If you're going to use which, whichever environment you're going to use or whichever the model for, we are searching for XGBoost, right? So in XGBoost, LDA. Yeah, there you go. So for XGBoost, I need to rely on, uh, yeah, for 0.9. I, I believe this was point now, which you utilize. Yeah. So I need to rely on this particular. So in case if I'm going to run it in US West one, West two or East one, I used to, this is what I need to use. Right. So blah, blah, blah. This is where exactly what, this is exactly what my ECR is elastic container registry. Right. And that is exactly what I have used over here. You can see over here container registry that has been used and slash XG boost and latest, right? We want to pick up the latest one. So it, so you can get this run in US West 2, East 1, East 2, US East 2, and EU West 1, right? In case if you want to go for any other region, that's up to you. So you can just pick up corresponding region of your choice and you have to just fill in that particular container registry information over here. Fair enough. I'm assuming everyone is fine with that part. So this is where your container is going to get pulled, right? Now you have to have a corresponding role also, right? The one which remember the first when we created our uh, SageMaker, we created a role. That's exactly what this role is, right? And now you can see over here how exactly I can build my model. Now the beauty of SageMaker is, okay, let, let's start with this part and then talk about the, the SageMaker one, right? So now remember we spoke about how exactly your SageMaker would look like. So I'm going to say for training my instance, I need an M1, M4 X large machines, right? Remember for our, for our training purpose, we have actually spinned up a machine, which was like, remember this machine was just um, T2 medium machine, right? This is our Jupyter notebook machines, but for the training purpose, I'm going to define over here. I need an instance, which is going to be my M1 dot uh, M4 dot X large machine, right? M sorry, ML dot M4 dot X large machine, right? It's not M1, it's ML, ML dot, right? So machine learning. Um, and I'm going to say my count is just needs to be one. Now you're thinking you have a humongous amount of data. Now you want to have a parallel process also in place. In that case, you may want to increase this count. Now, you may ask the question, how do I know whether I need one count or whether I need four count? That's mere sheer experience. We have just tried to play around with, at times we get a better result with one. At times it has been turned out that we are going to make it three or four machines that gave a better result 
it's just a parallelism how exactly you can bring in the parallelism in case your model execution you may have to slightly play, play around with because if you just bring in parallelism but your data cannot do that slicing or a streaming still your parallelism is not going to work and it's not of any good use for you you need to understand all those parameter in place right and then i'm going to name my uh, job as this one and that's that's all the parameter that you require right and now i need to uh, any questions over here let me just take a um, pause over here before we go to the next part any questions still here because that that's where you may have a logical are we all good till here or oh sorry uh, there was some question from someone you need to execute yeah so um sorry uh, someone has asked you have to df no it's not going to work because because i've done some data processing prior to this there was a multiple version of my data processing one so that's not going to do uh, even if i do that df that's going not going to work for me uh, because i've done some tweaking with a different uh, ipython model uh, module available for me which which i slightly goofed up but yeah so even if i execute it exactly the same way uh, you will get exact same results sorry any questions or are we all good till here or is it is it becoming so make sure you are you guys are in sync with me so this process is nothing but the docker container that was been brought in from here right so as i said from here whether should i be bringing one docker container or should i be bringing four different docker container over here that's exactly the question that you should be asking over here so that that part has been covered over here okay um my assumption is uh, silence is actually a little deadly um you either you understood it thoroughly completely or you didn't understand it anywhere right so if it's the in between stage there is going to be a lot of questions but okay i will take this assumption as your your okay kind till till here right okay now this is one of the key part which you need to understand in terms of hyperparameter right so a beauty of sage maker is um you can supply your hyperparameter to your algorithm for now for an xg boost these are my hyperparameters so maximum depth maximum depth is nothing but the number of uh, leaf that i can go that's exactly what um sorry the number of hierarchical structure that i can go is what your maximum depth is for your xg boost right um and something num round is talks about an objective function which i'm going to use is uh, linear and num round is nothing but how many attrition that i need to go um or how many jobs should be run executing that i'm i'm specifying over here my total number of job execution should be 150 right so 150 times uh this job is going to run for you before it's going to finalize and give you a um optimal model right so that's exactly what it means now so i've just listed down over here that's how exactly it looks like x estimator dot hyperparameter is going to be this value but the key point of what you need to understand over here is there is a function available in terms of hyperparameter i'll even send you this link i have not stored this link for you so i can have this num round parameter the continuous parameter which can go for 1 to 200 my lambda or my learning rate right when i talk about my eta is nothing but my learning rate over here i'm going to say here my learning rate is fixed 0.1 so instead i can set my learning rate from 0.1 to 0.9 right so what this range means is sage maker behind the scene it's going to play around with this hyperparameter values right and it's going to find out which is the best algorithm which is resulted into and it's going to flash out that particular hyperparameter for you and that's a very very great uh information or an insight for you so i can finalize okay if i use maximum depth of 5 and if i use objective um as a linear and if my eta is 0.1 and my subsample is 0.7 that's going to be my best model right but where did i get this information from i have just given a range specified over here it it should range from 0.01 to 10 for my alpha for my lambda it needs to be 0.01 and 10 and for my num round it should range from 1 to 200 that means the number of iteration can range from 1 to 200 so what sage maker behind the scene is going to run is 
it's going to pick up randomly one of these parameter and it's going to keep trying up right so every single parameter which is range specified over here will be picked as a parameter and it's going to do that execution and in one of these places if you go over here in sage makers console if you see in hyper parameter tuning job if you click on this right now you will not be seeing any data over here right over here you can see that 150 execution over here and you can see on the extreme right what is your objective function and which has given you a minimal uh, data available over there that means minimal um, functions whichever the metrics that you define over here for that corresponding what are the parameter that is getting used right which is going to be in my case i have picked it up as these were the best parameter that i can supply for this execution and i picked it up from there and i start utilizing it so in case if you want to use this model in the later point of time i know that that's the function or that's the metric that i, sh I should be using for each of these parameters and, and and that's going to give you a much better result right so this is not something which i use i've just picked it up from my sample um so sage maker documentation from uh, from amazon documentation so that you know this is how exactly you can specify a hyper parameter range right you can state state it as alpha continuous parameter range and this is the range i am specifying over here and then i'm going to have that tuner linear hyper parameter tuner and you can see over here this range hyper range linear is what i mentioned over here right and then i'm going to call my fit function right the tuner uh, underscore linear dot fit function the moment i call up my fit function is what your training is going to happen you can see that uh, happening over here at right? estimator dot fit you're going to have supply uh, x boost parameter over here and you can see your training jobs is going to get kicked off and this is how exactly your training job is going to get kicked off all right you can see uh, we have specified the number of iteration which is going to be this feed num job field or num round field which is going to be 150 you can see your job has executed for 150 times over here right and you can see over here to start with your rmsc error is going to be 242 to start with and your validation error was 240 with each iteration you can see that the parameter is going to get reduced for you i can see the parameter is going to get reduced when I reach almost 100, my parameter reaches close to somewhere around 50. And when I reach close to 150th execution of that particular algorithm, I can see it's pretty much close to um, what for my best RMSC root mean square error, right? I'm assuming you guys know all this, what exactly the RMSC is, right? You can see over here, it, it, is going to be my 41 and that's where 150th execution has resulted into 41.45 it's slightly lesser than this yeah right so that's where we define our learning rate and our um, rmsc is defined over here and you can see the number of execution the billable seconds for that particular execution is 64 seconds right you will be charged for this m4 machine that you spin up this ml.m4.xcharge machine, you'll be charged for 64 seconds. That's exactly what it means. Apart from the data transfer and all those costs, but your training instant charge will be just for 64 seconds. Compare this with the way you are doing traditionally. Traditionally, what you might, what might have been doing is you would have taken up an ml.p3.machine, uh, um, which is going to be a massive GPU-based machine, right? And for writing your code also, you're using exactly that particular G, um, uh, G, um, uh, GPU machine. Also for training purpose, also you're going to use your machine. So the, the time that you're using it is completely wasted when you're actually, you as a data scientist, when you're writing your model, when you're preparing your data, you're doing your data engineering. During that time, you are actually using a GPU-based machine. But over here, only during the training training time, your GPU-based machines are going to come up, and which is going to be just 64 seconds. And you have been built for that GPU-based machine only for 64 seconds, whatever you have specified over here. Right? So that's exactly what's happening over here. And once I am done with my execution, 
I get my model created, and next, uh, the code I'm going to explain is instance type for my inference purpose. That's going to be my again m one for x large, and I can have my endpoint created as uh, x boost dot by uh, train hyphen v one. So what is going to happen is I'm just going to show you this, which I have already executed. So the moment I do this execution, what's going to happen is I'm just going to go to my um, North Virginia region where I could see, um, I'm assuming I still have my endpoint deployed over there. Oh, did I remove it? Oh, no. Yeah. So that's exactly what my, so the moment you're done with that execution part, you are going to get automatically an endpoint created over here. And this is the endpoint. If I click on this endpoint, you can see over here an HTTPS link is going to get created. And from your external application, you're going to call this API. You're going to make an API call for this endpoint, right? And you're going to get your um, results executed. That's how exactly you're going to perform your um, training over here. So we have done, I've just done a small data prediction over here, just supplying this particular data to this predictor, and it's giving me a result back. So for this, based on this particular data, uh, the number of bikes that is required would be 39, uh, so three in the evening. That, that That's exactly what it would be. So 39 bikes are required over here. That's exactly the count it has resulted into. Right. So that's how you're going to do your end-to-end -end, um, deployment as well as prediction part. Um, any quick questions? Let me just open the floor for questions for the remaining 10 minutes that's available. And I'll, I'll, I'll do those corrections whatever required over here and I'll I'll um, post it into your uh, repository wherever you can just pick it up and run it on your own environment itself right uh, any question anywhere if you want to go back and then hi uh, can we uh, spin up a uh, let's say a docker from any other registry apart from ECR? um I have not done that. Uh, apart from ECR, I doubt that's a possible. So let me just take down the question. Um, yeah, that didn't come in my mind either. So I would assume that may not be possible, but just to, I mean, yeah, it's a nice way of uh, a trainer doing it, right? So instead of answering your direct question, I uh, pick up another question out of your question and then answering it. So that question, whatever you asked, I... Um, Frankly and openly, I don't have an answer to it. Can we go for anywhere? I doubt that will be possible because easier then you may have to have a lot of configuration changes. So my gut feeling is would not be possible, but you can bring your own model. You can create a Docker container out of it and then you can bring it into an ECR and you can make a call from there, right? So that is possible for you. But if you don't like ECR, mm, I doubt. Sure, thank you. No problem, yeah. So that's, that's a pretty good question. Um, I should have given you that insight as well. So in case if you are, if you want to bring in your own custom model, create that model and that can be pushed into our ECR registry and I can just call it from there. Or that's possible for you. I'll just check back. But my gut feeling or my 90%, we are talking about confidence interval, right? So that's 90% of the confidence interval of mine says it may not be possible because that's, uh, there might be a huge amount of changes required in that case. Yeah. Uh, any more questions, folks? Yeah, and also, also, um, just want to give you a heads up. So the predict one, the one which I have file over here, I think I may have to do some tweaking over there as well. The the predict one, I'm going to send it across to you. It's a pretty small file. You can just execute on your own end with the test data. Remember, we have created bike underscore test. The moment you execute it, you're going to get that result result part. So this is how. So the the reason behind I said there is tweaking required because I am getting slightly a haywire results. I have goofed it up somewhere and I was not able to find out the solution. So I can see my data is coming up with, with massive, um, it, it's predicting around uh, a huge number, in fact. So somewhere I have goofed it up. I may have to do some tweaking and find out where exactly. And you yourself can do that part. It, it's uh, This notebook is something which I'm going to share it with you guys. So you can run it on bike underscore uh, test.csv which will be available with you when you, the moment you execute those uh, commands. You're able to link to the concept. Um, 
my uh, am I, is my assumption okay i i did not actually clarify my assumption first but I, even if you say no i'm not a data scientist we, it would not have been a room where we will be able to spend time of doing that but my because our assumption or the prerequisite was you have to have some sort of a model building um, exercise being carried out you know what is training validation testing and all those things so that was expectation and also expectation was you need to have a fair of bit of information about how exactly cloud environment works so these two information in place i guess it should be we should be all in sync but any questions please feel free to shoot we have enough time what's what do you think was a missing link apart from one execution part of it uh, i just wanted to have a fresh environment created that's that's something which which goofed up slightly because otherwise we could have done uh, an execution over here uh which is available for me over here so if you see my north virginia uh it's not virginia yeah uh and my notebook instance uh is it up and running yeah my jupyter is up and running so i have multiple data processing files available with me right so i have just tweaked it and kept it on the other one and see make a one yeah so these were um the multiple version available for this so which i i created took this and embedded on top of this and made this so in between i missed some couple of step uh which may take a lot of time for again doing that repair activity but that's exactly what the execution i did some time back so that should be fine there's nothing different that you're going to see as an out, uh, output apart from a slow motion wise you may see one by one that's getting executed other than that, not, other than that nothing but yeah i mean uh, just want to have your um, valid feedback like uh, do you think anything can be done um uh, to improve this program or or what do you think uh, what do you think can be best done it it's just it's a mutual um help right so where do you think if this was done slightly in this manner that would have been much beneficial for me as a participant it's fair fair enough us so if you have something of that sort please do throw in your lights or your comments so that we can improve this program based on how you think that can be improved if you don't have any questions huh? by the way if you have questions please shoot your questions but otherwise if you think no if this 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 module has been slightly more elaborated yeah i i think that that's something which i would be able to understand much better or this portion i was not very clear about such kind of discussion or information is what we would like to have absolutely nothing so we are 7 minutes ahead of time so is it like the moment i give this file you will be able to create it on your own and then then run the process without i mean without any hassle is that is that what you think so you are becoming a a sage maker enabled data scientist shyam tudian hi uh, can we uh, integrate any visualization uh, data tool uh, with this with sage maker yes. uh, sage maker itself uh, you're telling can i connect it with a uh, um power bi power bi or um i may not know what would be the real because because as a visualization part we actually can have uh um any of the plotting or anything being done over here itself is there any other additional services that you can connect i may have to check my gut feeling is um cannot be can we connect any visualization tool but um where would you think would that be a real necessity because i mean you can have an um um uh, an api call for quick site can be enabled i'm not sure i have never done it because i was always happy with uh, the kind of either matplot or even the existing python uh, visualization some of those apis that has been given is what i have always used so i have not tried connecting with any other additional services but i uh, can check and come back to you on that because do you do that uh, whenever you are running that on your jupyter notebook mm -hmm. uh, in your current current environment do you actually rely on some other visualization as well uh, not really uh, okay. so we have a different team uh, so in that case uh, what they do is they actually pull up the data manually and okay. uh, 
create uh, like utilize that and create a like use it in with a visual got it got it got it you you separately you want to have a much more uh, enriched kind of a visualization so you rely on tableau or any of the other tool and yeah. before you actually bring in your data got it got it yeah uh but in that case maybe you may have to do this exact same exercise over here as well as what i feel because um i think so this is a container way blah 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 i i doubt whether that will be possible but but yeah i to be frank i don't have the yeah that that's exactly what it is you can use matplotlib and cpon packages which is quite good yeah true so that's the matplotlib matplotlib is what we use and the cpon packages is exactly so exactly the way you're using your jupyter notebook you can use exactly the same way but connecting to an external source that's something something normally a data scientist don't use it but but yeah you never know so the the can be remote kind of scenario that can you can end up with right but yeah uh, that's that's something new that something even i will try to find out from my mind as well yeah that's true data scientists don't business analyst mostly does <clears throat> yeah but but i would say when i am doing my data engineering and trying to run my training testing there was no need ever i have never seen a practical scenario where uh a a business analyst also had to do it unless and until i am process my data and send it across and then they are doing it right so that's that's a different uh, arena altogether right so that's not really my data enriching in terms of model building but before i get my model, absolutely i mean the gentleman who asked this question is absolutely right right so before i even get into this part i just want to do a, a good amount of visualization yeah that that's a fair ask but in between in a jupyter notebook I have not seen many guys doing that. Now very quickly let's summarize today's video. In today's video we discuss the functions that Amazon SageMaker helps in performing. Elaborate on Amazon SageMaker architecture, then we demonstrated a practical application using Amazon SageMaker. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, I want to request you to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new update or video releases from Great Learning. If you enjoy this video show us some love and like this video knowledge increases by sharing so make sure you share this video with your friends and colleagues make sure to comment on the video for any query or suggestions and i will respond to your comments